This is Europe and the United States in the 20th century, class number 14. The reconstruction of Europe's post-Cold War order. And in this class, we're going to examine the decade in the 1990s. And we're going to be mainly concerned with how Europe's security structures evolve, especially NATO and in particular the United States' role within the European security system. How, how I suppose there is a debate during the course of the 1990s about what sort of role the United States should be playing and indeed what sort of role NATO itself should actually be playing uh, throughout this particular decade. Um, the one thing I'm not going to talk about um, in this particular lecture is the crisis in Yugoslavia. I'm going to wait. I'm going to leave that for the final uh, for the final class. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about the events of the 1990s, but I think it's important to bear in mind when we talk about NATO and the debates about NATO and American involvement in European affairs in, 19, in the 1990s. Um, all of this takes place in the context of the crisis in Yugoslavia, the ongoing wars in the former Yugoslavia in the 1990s, uh, which you know, the political crisis basically begins at the beginning of the decade. The war breaks out in 92 when Slovenia and Croatia secede from the Yugoslav Federation, Bosnia the following year in 1993, then you have Kosovo at the end of the decade in 99. Um, so the crisis in Yugoslavia very much stretches right the way across this 10 year period. And as I say, it, this is the context in which many of the sort of debates about NATO and uh, all these other things, um, you know, th this, this is, very, as I say, very much the context for all of that. But as I say, we will get onto the crisis specifically in the next class but I think it's important to bear that in mind and I think at periodic junctures um, in today's lecture I will sort of remind ourselves that this, this, this conflict was ongoing. Okay I think it's worth starting by considering some of the wider things that were happening in the international system um, at the beginning of the 1990s. The key moment of course is the end of the Cold War so as we sort of concluded our last class we talked about the events, 1988-89, which ultimately ends with the fall of the Berlin Wall and various communist governments throughout Eastern Europe being toppled. Um, and ultimately, of course, you know, the end of the Soviet Empire in Eastern Europe. So beginning of the 1990s then, so, so you know, thinking uh, at the beginning of 1990 itself, uh, the Soviet Union, of course, still exists. You know, it, it lasts for the best part of another two years. No, it's not until the end of 1991 that the Soviet Union itself uh, disintegrates. Um, but its communist empire in Eastern Europe has disappeared. And I remember living through these events. I remember them quite well. And at the time, I think there was a general feeling that something very, very momentous had just taken place, that, you know, we were living through history. And when I first started studying international relations uh, around 1993, so, I, you know, I was literally sort of beginning my formal um, education in international politics a year or two after the Soviet Union itself had disappeared. Um, I think the assumption was that something very, very sort of profound had taken place. So we talk about this idea that this was a revolutionary moment, which is the first point I put on the PowerPoint there. The reason why I put a question mark over that is I think 20, 20, 30 years later, historians, at least some historians, have perhaps begun to question whether this was quite as revolutionary as actually seemed to be the case at the time. Um, and the case for saying that actually uh, the events weren't quite as momentous, momentous as they first appeared uh, rests on several arguments. Most particularly, I think, is the, uh, is the idea that when you looked at the 1990s, the international terrain still seemed rather familiar. Uh, 
Not least, there are a number of international institutions which sort of emerge as a result of the Cold War, um, but are still very much present even after the Cold War itself comes to an end. The outstanding example, of course, is NATO, you know, the Cold War organization par excellence, if you like. Um, and there is certainly a debate, and we'll get onto this in a moment, about what was going to happen to NATO now that the Cold War had come to an end. Um, but the striking thing is, though, of course, it doesn't disappear. It persists. Um, despite the fact that its Cold War mission is no longer relevant, you know, especially after, well, not seemingly no longer quite as relevant after, after 1991, with the disappearance of the Soviet Union, NATO itself continues to function. I suppose one of the questions we're going to address, um, if not now, then certainly in our discussion class, because I think it's an interesting question, is why, you know, why doesn't NATO disappear? Or at least why isn't it reconstituted? Why isn't there, why isn't there a new international organisation put in its place? Um, then the United Nations, again, that emerges out of the Second World War. And indeed, there are hopes that the United Nations will actually function more effectively in a post-Cold War world. And we'll get on to that in a moment. The European Union, International Monetary Fund, you name it, you know, loads and loads of you know, major organisations um, which sort of grow up, if you like, during the Cold War. Um, and they remain, you know, they don't disappear. Uh, another line of argument is that the fundamental nature of the way, I suppose, power within the international system was not altered as a result of the end of the Cold War. So the power distribution remained pretty much intact. Um, so just as the United States in the late 80s was the world's most powerful state superpower, um, the same is true in the 1990s, albeit the United States is no longer counterbalanced by another uh, superpower or at least major power, more or less of, 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 sort of equal status. Um, the North-South divide, so the rich remained very rich, the poor remained very poor. Indeed, the relative position of the poorest parts of the world, if anything, gets even worse during the 1990s basically sub-Saharan Africa. Um, so things like that, as I say, the distribution of the power, distribution of power with, throughout the international system, that is not fundamentally altered. Um, and then the idea that of a new Europe, again, how new is the new Europe? Again, that is something that we need to uh, think about. I mean, it's important to note, of course, that early 1990s, there are big ambitions when it comes to the European project, you know, with the Cold War over, you know, there are many people thinking that now is the hour of Europe. And again, we need to kind of consider uh, uh, the extent to which this was indeed true. And again, it's worth noting, beginning of the 1990s, you know, there's a, a sort of ongoing debate, I suppose, as to what sort of trajectory international relations, international politics will sort of embark upon. And I think there are basically two groups in terms of who are thinking about future events. Um, the first group you might label the optimists. And I think their chief spokesman was pro pro President H. W. Bush, president from 1989 to 1993 who famously announces that we were now seeing a new world order with the end of the Cold War. Um, another major figure, of course, is the sort of philosopher Francis Fukuyama, who sort of has a, takes a sort of Hegelian view of international relations and announces that we had now reached the end of history, as he puts it. Essentially, he argues that the ideological struggle between communism and liberal democratic capitalism, that had come to an end with an unvarnished victory for Western liberal democracy. And in Fukuyama's view, you know, you could look forward to a more stable, more peaceful and probably a rather more boring international order. Um, but essentially, he says, yes, this is a Western triumph. And from this perspective, you know, again, there are a number of arguments that uh, uh, kind of are presented 
in support of this particular thesis. Um, first and foremost, again, as I alluded to a moment ago, there's this notion that with the Cold War over and with the United States and the Soviet Union no longer vetoing each other's resolutions within the UN Security Council, you could look forward to the United Nations finally functioning in a way that its founders had intended, that the United Nations would, as an organisation, uh, be able to promote international peace and stability. Um, and for those casting around for evidence for this at the beginning of the 1990s, they could always po point to the first Persian Gulf War, uh, when the international community responds to Iraq's invasion of Kuwait in 1990. Under the leadership of the United States, the UN assembles an international coalition. Um, and effectively, they embark upon a sort of international police action, which leads to the liberation of Kuwait. And crucially, the Soviet Union under Gorbachev in the you know, spring, uh, actually, it was, looking back on it now, it was, uh, it was the beginning of 1991, wasn't it? But yeah, Gorbachev you know, plays a relatively supportive role. He certainly does nothing to severely undermine uh, the Western efforts to, uh, to, to, to liberate Kuwait. Um, so that seemed to indicate that perhaps, indeed, the UN as an institution would actually be able to uh, to uh, uh, function in the way that, uh, uh, as I say, its uh, original founders had intended. Then there was this belief that the United States, freed from the shackles of the Cold War, would be able to finally perform the role of international hegemon, that it could actually enforce a, a reasonable degree of international stability. Then there were people who pointed to the sort of continuing transatlantic partnership with a more integrated Europe, a, a, you know, a Western European bloc, if you like, which would play a supporting role uh, alongside the United States. And again, you know, those who, uh, who made this argument could point to the experience of the Gulf War, where at least two major European powers, Britain and France, have contributed military forces to that operation. Um, so all in all, yeah, as I say, the optimists uh, uh, made the case that the 1990s were going to be a more peaceful and a more stable world. However, as ever, there were a group of naysayers, and these could be labelled the pessimists, and I would say probably the chief spokesman for the pessimists might not be John Mearsheimer, uh, an international relations neorealist scholar. And from Mearsheimer's perspective, uh, well, he writes a famous article in, you know, very well-known uh, inter uh, international relations journal, International Security, I think it's published in 1992, entitled Back to the Future. And from Mearsheimer's perspective, it was not the case that history had ended, but rather he argues that history had basically been frozen for the 40-year period of 45 year old 45 year 45 year period um, of the uh, of, of, of the Cold War and with the Cold War coming to an end what we could effectively expect to see was history restarting so not so much you know not so much the end of history but rather history once again uh, uh, as a restarting moving onwards. Um, and he advances a couple of arguments in favour of this. First of all, he says that with the absence, this is a typical sort of neorealist argument, the absence of an external threat would almost certainly lead to fragmentation among the Western camp, if you like. He says, you know, it was the Soviet Union which basically holds Europe together, holds the transatlantic alliance together. With the Soviet Union having disappeared, what you could expect would be greater friction, maybe even conflict between various European states. Um, he also argues that with the Cold War over, you could look forward to the United States embarking upon a more isolationist policy. You know, it no longer needed to be involved in Europe, so you could, you know, you could envisage the United States substantially reducing its presence, if not withdrawing completely from the European continent, its military presence. 
Um, as I say, relations between Western European states could be expected to deteriorate. Um, and for those making this case, they could always point to, well, first of all, Yugoslavia, but then in all, um, uh, in other areas of the sort of post-Soviet, the former, the ex, yes, the post-Soviet empire, if you like, uh, with ethnic conflicts breaking out between, you know, various republics and say, you know, this, this unfortunately was going to be the future, you know, this was not going to be the sort of peaceful utopia that, uh, Francis Fukuyama and others were imagining uh, at roughly the same time. So two sort of different visions. And I suppose one of the questions we, I want to think about today is which group ultimately were proved to were proved, have been proved to be correct. You know, were the optimists right or the pessimists? And I think yeah, that I think I would probably have answered that question. Um, in a slightly different way 10 years ago, but history moves on and I think uh, our answers to these questions are continually sort of evolving. Let's think about the transatlantic relationship and I think one persistent theme in the sort of literature on this topic is that um, you see at the end of the Cold War, the, actually, the actual terminology by different historians and different political scientists varies. But essentially what they are saying is that the Europeans and the Americans have to decide what the terms of the new post-Cold War transatlantic partnership are going to be. So one of my old teachers, Ian Clark, who's written, uh, who, who wrote a book on, uh, on, on this very subject, really, I suppose, the kind of post-Cold War European order, there was actually a copy of it in the Egalonian Library. Um, he talks about this idea, he, he basically views the 1990s, certainly the early 1990s, as a period of peacemaking. So it says one way of thinking about what happens with at the end of the Cold War, uh, as with any war, is that you have to have this sort of process of peacemaking. Um, and when you think about how wars end, I mean, they all wars tend to end in several different ways. But one way that they end is that, you know, all the parties come around the table and and uh, sign a peace treaty and and you know legally if you like the conflict is brought to an end that doesn't always happen it doesn't happen at the end of the second world war indeed when you look at the sort of um the detente period german ostpolitik late 60s 70s you know one way of interpreting that is 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 a belated effort at, at peacemaking at the end of the second world war um as i say early 1990s one way of viewing how the europeans and the united states engage with one another is that they go through a phase of peacemaking um other historians lundestad for example uh he doesn't use the phrase peacemaking but he talks about the europeans and americans reissuing their invitations or the europeans reissuing their invitations to the united states essentially say, look, we want you to continue. We want there to be a continued American presence. Um, but again, the sort of recognition that the terms of that relationship were obviously going to have to change with the end of the Cold War. Um, another historian, Jeffrey Sloan, I reviewed his book uh, a few years ago, um, but he talks about this idea of renegotiating the transatlantic bargain, the transatlantic bargain effectively being the mutual sort of obligations of the Americans and the Europeans. The original transatlantic bargain struck, I suppose, in the late 1940s, you know, with the Marshall Plan and eventually the North Atlantic Treaty. The original transatlantic bargain essentially being that the United States would fully commit itself to the defense of Western Europe. In return, its Western European allies would be willing to accept American political leadership. You know, these are essentially the terms. Obviously, the world in the 1990s, beginning of the 1990s, very, very different from the late 1940s. But nonetheless, there is this sense that, um, you know, there is this sense that uh, um, that the partnership between the United States and Western Europe needs to continue. Um, in terms of Ian Clark's idea of peacemaking, he basically makes the argument that when you think about a treaty, 
there's usually two aspects to it, a peace treaty, which brings a war to an end. There's usually two aspects to it. One, he says, there's a regulatory role. Um, no, actually, I'll do that second. <laughs> so first, he says, there's a redistributive aspect to the treaty. So if you think about the Versailles Peace Treaty, just to do a little bit of revision momentarily, um, obviously, there was an awful lot of redistribution that goes on at the end of the First World War. Um, and there's redistribution in terms of territory, in terms of deciding you know, which state gets what, which bits of land, etc. Um, and you see this with the sort of Ostpolitik and, uh, you know, the Conference of Security in the 60s and 70s, which was sort of, I suppose, giving a legal recognition of the post-1945 realities of Europe. Um, so there's a redistributive aspect in terms of territory. There's redistribution in terms of also resources. So you think about uh, uh, you know, France getting the Saar Valley. Uh, at the end of the First World War, I say it's getting, but administering the Saar Valley at the end of the First World War for 15 years, I think it was, wasn't it? Um, and also, of course, German reparations, you know, the fact that, 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 that Germany was going to be made to pay. And then a treaty has a regulatory role as well. And that's basically what sort of institutions, what sort of rules are going to uh, be constructed in order to regulate the post, you know, post post-war order or in this case the post-cold war order and as i say one view can can view the 1990s as a period of peacemaking or at least i suppose the europeans and the americans groping their way towards some kind of new european order uh, or possibly a new transatlantic bargain and as i say Lundstedt talks about uh, effectively um, uh, reissuing the uh, the uh, uh, the invitations Probably the single biggest fundamental change to the European order is what happens to Germany. And of course, in 1990, Germany is unified. But that was not necessarily given. And to be honest, I'm going to pass over this very this part of the story very quickly. And we will return to it in much, much more detail, I think, in our discussion class. Because A, it's a fascinating story and I don't have time to do it justice uh, right now. Um, Secondly, there's a really, really good chapter by Timothy Garson Ash, which talks a bit talks about how the dynamics of, of unification take place. And there's a couple of other quite good uh, articles uh, in uh, on the reading list on, uh, about this topic. Um, but yeah, I mean, in terms of the post-war European order and what sort of what sort of you know, what sort of post-Cold War peace there was going to be, as ever, Germany was going to be a central part of it. Um, 1989, I'll say 9th of November 1989, the Berlin Wall comes down. Um, communist government collapses in East Germany. Shortly after that, new elections are organised in East Germany uh, and a new democratically elected government comes to power. I think, you know, in the immediate days, maybe even weeks after the Berlin Wall has come down, I've, there is an expectation around Europe that there, that there are going to be two German states for some time to come. And there's a, there's a quotation here from D.C. Watt, who was, I'm not sure if he's still alive now, probably not. If he is, he must be bloody old. Um, but yeah, well-known sort of British diplomatic historian who says um, in 1989 there will still be two Germanies and there's a typo there it should be Germanies 50 years from now which just goes to show if you want a prediction for the future never ask a historian um, and there you know there are plenty of Europeans who maybe if not 50 years but you know there's an expectation that that Germany unification if it happens at all it's going to be at some point in you know the medium term or even the long term it's not going to happen uh, it's certainly not going to happen overnight um of course when you look at the story of german unification though um everybody is proved wrong all these people who are saying you know there's going to be two germanies you know they are proved wrong german the process of german unification 
happens extremely quickly. And this was one of the fascinating questions, and I will we will address this in our discussion class is why it happens so quickly. You know, why why isn't the process more protracted? Um, but as I say, we will I'll set that question um, uh, to one side. Um, but yeah, in less than a year, so in you know, in less than a year, I think it's a, I forget the exact date, but I think it's in October 1990, you have the official day of German unity. So as I said, the process proceeds remarkably swiftly. Um, there are various factors for accounting why Germany is united. Uh, not least it's, I mean, I think the single biggest reason is the Germans want Germany to be united. Um, but there are plenty of other factors as well. And the role of the United States as well is absolutely crucial. Bush, basically, George H.W. Bush, basically comes out fully in favour of a united Germany, except he adds one particular condition, and that is Germany has to continue to be a NATO member. Um, on the other hand, there are plenty of Europeans far from happy about this notion. Um, but nonetheless, when it comes to it, uh, I, I say among the Europeans, most, you know, I suppose the outstanding examples are Margaret Thatcher, who never really reconciled herself to the idea of a united Germany. Francois Mitterrand, who, to begin with, is almost as equally opposed, but then sort of political realism kicks in and he recognises that France probably can't do anything to block it. And we'll get on to that. Um, and then, of course, you have a new post-communist government in Poland in 1990 as well. Um, and they, too, are sort of watching developments on their on their uh, western frontier with a degree of trepidation. You know, a united Germany from the Polish perspective is not good news for obvious historical reasons. And I've got a quotation here for, about Thatcher and Germany. As I say, Mrs. Thatcher, not an admirer of Germany, to put it mildly. Um, her sort of anti German, anti Teutonic, if you like, instincts um, were, you know, were legendary. Um, and uh, there's a good uh, line in her memoir. She says, I don't believe in collective guilt, but I do believe in national character. So what she's sort of saying here is that I don't hold today's Germans responsible for the horrors of Auschwitz and what have you. On the other hand, she says, I do believe in national character, essentially saying, but, uh, you know, I don't really think they've changed. You know, I think. Um, so, yeah, as I say, deeply sort of suspicious about you know, about Germany uh, um, and you know, the, the notion of a united Germany, she finds particularly abhorrent. She actually hosts a sem seminar at Chequers, which is the prime minister's country house in, in Britain. She invites along a load of German academics. Among them is Timothy Garton Ash, who's quite, you know, quite a liberal uh, German academic. Uh, uh, so British academic, but German specialist, Norman Stone, who's very kind of conservative, um, somebody like Archie Brown, I think he was there as well, again, another Eastern European perspective. And she basically asked them the question, you know, can you trust the Germans? And it's quite instructive, I think, that despite their sort of ideological differences, they're pretty united in their response. And they basically tell her, you know, don't worry, you know, West Germany, is a modern, stable, democratic state. Um, just because Germany unifies does not mean that it's once you know you're going to witness the establishment of a fourth rank. This is not the answer that she wants to hear, though. She knows she 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 never re reconciles herself to the idea that Germany was going to be united. Um, the actual process again. I'm going to skip over this pretty quickly, but. Um, in terms of why it happened so quickly, I mean, one factor is certainly that Helmut Kohl, the West German Chancellor, starts pressing for unification quite quickly. Uh, you know, his initial reaction is unification will take uh, take place over over the course of five years, um, but within a matter of days, he sort of decides that no, this now is the moment. Now is the now is the moment to try and seize this opportunity for unification. So he unveils a ten point plan. 
um, in November 1989. So literally, as I said, within you know a few days of the Berlin Wall coming down, coal is already pub publicly pushing for it. Um, as I say, the United the United States supports coal, and it's actually the Americans who push, who who um, uh, propose. Sorry. It's the Americans who proposed the idea of a two plus four formula. In other words, the Americans say it, it that the two German states can decide between themselves all issues which are you know which are which are purely German, if you like. Uh, but they suggest that the four occupying powers, you know, four the, the, the four post Second World War occupying powers should also be given a role in this process, and they would deal with the sort of external aspects uh, of external consequences of Germany's unification. But he assures Cole, and this is important, that the two plus four plan is not there to be an obstacle to German unification, but rather it will ultimately be used to facilitate German unification. So he essentially reassures Cole and says, you know, you can count on our support. You know, we will, we will play a constructive role in um, in, in establishing a united Germany. Another key moment is a NATO summit that is held in London in 1990, in which the various political leaders who attend, uh, obviously Bush is there, Thatcher, Cole, um, but they basically pledge to reform NATO in a way that will make it less threatening to the Soviet Union. And they publicly declare that the Soviet Union itself is no longer regarded as being an enemy. And then in the course of 1990, Cole and Gorbachev have a number of intense meetings. Uh, I think the first round take place in Moscow. And then there is a second round, which are held in a sort of remote, I forget exactly where it is, but I think it's in the Caucasus somewhere, or close to the Caucasus. I think actually in Russian territory. But, uh, uh, but Cole and Gorbachev basically put the, you know, put the final negotiations and they eventually agree, as I say, yeah, 3rd of October is going to be the day of German unity. Um, now, that's a sort of very shortened summary of the main developments. Um, but yeah, I mean, there are a number of questions which we need to address. That, as I said, one is why does the process proceed so quickly? But I think there's also some interesting uh, um, issues in relation to the sort of various personalities who are involved in this process. And another really interesting question, and again, we'll, we'll, we'll definitely address this, is does German unification actually represent a triumph for West German Ostpolitik? You know, ultimate, the ultimate goal of West Pol of, of Ostpolitik of Ost is German unification. And of course, unification transpires in 1990. Um, but then it begs the question, well, how far does Ostpolitik contribute to that? And as I say, Timothy Gartenash, um, his chapter, and I'll make sure there's a, a, a link posted, um, um, his chapter addresses this very issue. And I think he, you know, he makes an interesting argument on this point. And as I say, we will discuss this. So as I say, German unification is probably the single biggest change in the European order. Um, then the other question is, as I say, the role of the United States. As I say, Bush, when he is overseeing the process of German unification, or I'm not sure if he was overseeing, but at least playing a significant role, let's put it that way, in the process of German unification. As I say, one of his conditions is that West Germany has to continue to remain a member of NATO. Um, so it's clear at the beginning of the 1990s that the United States still very much wants NATO to continue, that the United States sees for itself, you know, sees itself playing a significant role within the European security system. However, Bush is off the political scene by the beginning of 1993. Um, poor old George H.W. Bush, he is failed to be re-elected in 1992, and he's beaten by this guy, Slick Willie, as he was sometimes known, but Bill Clinton. Um, and a couple of things to say this. First of all, um, 
Bush's ultimate defeat comes as something of a shock in the sense 1991 Bush's popularity ratings are sky high. You know, he's overseeing the peaceful end of the, end of the Cold War. And then he's led the United States into a, into a war against Iraq, which has resulted in a very decisive victory. Um, so all things considered, Bush, as I said, was immensely popular uh, throughout most of 1991. And many people were essentially saying that, you know, that uh, he was a shoe in for a second term, to the point at which that many senior Democrats in 1992 decide that they don't even they don't even want to try and challenge Bush, and they decide that they are going to you know sit this one out. So it falls upon. I was going to say obscure. I don't think that's entirely fair. I think Clinton had been a sort of rising star in Democratic politics for quite some time, but nonetheless, he was not a particularly senior figure in the Democratic Party. He was governor of Arkansas, which is not one of the, uh, let's say, one of the most important states in the Union. Uh, you know, he's not governor of California or Texas or somewhere like that. Um, but it's Clinton who, despite one or two scandals emerging through through the sort of primaries and things like that, Clinton nonetheless captures the Democratic nomination, and then he goes on goes and pulls off a victory against Bush in the 1992 election. Um, and the unofficial slogan of Clinton's campaign is "It's the economy, stupid." And Clinton's critique is quite a simple one. He, he, he essentially argued that Bush had been far too involved in fighting wars in the Middle East, dealing with Gorbachev, but he hadn't been paying enough attention to America's domestic problems. Clinton promises that he would face, so he would focus laser-like on the American economy. It was also worth noting, and this obviously has a major impact on Bush's ultimate defeat, um, 1992, the American economy is dipping into a recession, and, and, and you know, given that's enough to, uh, to for, for for Bush to fail, it would be quite interesting to see how Trump fares, uh, given the you know the, given that we are now facing something approaching a global economic depression as a as a consequence of the current health crisis. Um, but yeah, I mean, generally speaking, rule of thumb: if the economy is in bad shape. Um, politicians and American presidents don't tend to get re-elected. Um, so I'll say Clinton basically bases his campaign on the promise that he would actually rebuild the American economy. Um, a couple of things to say about Clinton. First of all, he did not have much experience in foreign policy, and indeed he was not particularly interested in foreign policy. If you are governor of Arkansas, then you don't really have much to say. I mean, you can imagine some governors of American states like New York, as I say, New York, California, California, they, they, there probably is a sort of foreign policy aspect to the job. Um, of these really, really big and important American states. Um, but Arkansas, not so much. And as I say, uh, Clinton, you know, as governor of Arkansas, not, had not really been very involved in foreign, foreign affairs. And indeed, he wasn't even particularly interested, uh, which again is significant. And apparently in this first year in his presidency, I'm not quite sure where I got this quotation from, but I think it's legit. But apparently he, d he says in the course of his uh, uh, first year of his administration, he says, foreign policy is not what I came here to do, which sort of suggests that Clinton hadn't actually read what the job description of an American president actually was. Um, added to that, the first year of his presidency does not go particularly well for Clinton, either domestically or in terms of foreign policy. Probably the single biggest disaster is Somalia, which if you've seen the film Black Hawk Down, you probably, uh, you know, it sort of describes some of the events of what happens there. But essentially, uh, Clinton inherits um, um, a military mission in Somalia from Georgia H.W. Bush, and the mission goes very badly wrong. Loads of American, well, loads, but a number of American soldiers are killed. Bodies dragged through the streets of Mogadishu. 
Um, and it's a, you know, it's an embarrassment for Clinton, essentially. And ultimately, Clinton decides to withdraw from 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 Somalia. Uh, Haiti is another, uh, you know, was another sort of mini crisis that happens in Clinton's first year. I won't go into that, but again, there's a general feeling that Clinton does not ha does not handle the situation particularly particularly well. Um, what Clinton takes away from this, I think, is that. Uh, um, foreign policy is not, you know, is not something that he should try and minimise. You know, something that, he, you know, he's an area of government. Let's say that Clinton wanted to try and minimise his involvement in that has some rather tragic consequences. Of course, the following year in 1994, when mass killings sort of break out in um in, uh, in in rwanda tribal warfare and uh, uh and you know and basically genocide is committed and the clinton administration very consciously decides that it does not want to be you know does not want to be involved in bringing this to bringing this to an end um which clinton later acknowledged was a mistake he, he visits africa a few years later uh, as president and effectively apologizes and said that the United States and the international community should have done more to, 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 to prevent the genocide. A couple other points to make on the slide. First of all, yeah, Clinton, although not interested in foreign policy, did certainly have European connections. He'd been a Rhodes Scholar, so he'd studied in UK, he visited Europe. Um, so, you know, he, he, he was somebody who had, if you like, uh, uh, connections uh, on the other side of the pond. Also during the 1992 campaign, and we'll talk more about this in, uh, in in the final lecture when we talk about the crisis in Yugoslavia, but Clinton does allude to the crisis and suggests that were he to become president, the United States, that uh, he would take a rather tougher approach to uh, what was happening in Yugoslavia. In terms of the transatlantic relationship then in the 1990s, and the first point that I said there, um, in some ways, surprisingly little does change at the beginning of the 1990s. Again, we're back to the point I made at the beginning about the end of the Cold War being this sort of revolutionary moment. What was it, though? And in terms of, if you like, the sort of the structure of the transatlantic partnership, not much actually changes. For one thing, contrary to Mearsheimer's predictions, the United States does not immediately withdraw. It does not immediately retreat. Now, admittedly, its military presence, for obvious reasons, is very significantly downgraded as a result of the end of the Cold War. I think at its peak, the United States has well over half a million men deployed in Europe. Um, by the early 1990s, that's down to well under 100,000. Um, but while the military presence is significantly downgraded, the United States does not depart. You know, there are still American bases in Germany and in other European countries. You know, the, the American military footprint is still very much visible in Europe as it remains today. So this lurch into isolationism, that does not happen at the, at the, at the beginning of the 1990s. Um, so one of the articles on the reading list is a good article, I was why I've included it, although it's slightly old, um, is by uh, Robert Art, and he takes a sort of realist view, and Mia Scheimer also shares this view, but essentially the argument is that the United States continues to play this offshore balancing role. Um, essentially the argument being that the US presence sort of reduces the possibility of conflict or friction emerging between various European states. And above all else, the American presence reassures the Europeans um, that a united Germany is not going to become a major problem. Um, 1990, you have the issuing of a transatlantic declaration where the European community, as it then was, and the United States issue a common declaration promising that they will continue to work together and again I think another feature of the 1990s is that the transatlantic partnership begins to become more institutionalized you know a number a number of institutions emerge which in the course of the 1990s which basically means that European um, and American cooperation by European I'm essentially talking about the European Union but you 
European and American cooperation is easier to achieve with the with the establishment of new kinds of institutions. Um, having said all that, for what was it fourth point? Sorry, the United States does appear to reevaluate its relations with some individual powers, most notably Britain. Uh, Clinton's relationship with the British Prime Minister uh, in this in the early to mid nineteen nineties was not particularly warm. Um, Britain was being led after Thatcher resigns at the end of 1990. Britain is led by John Major, um, a Conservative Prime Minister. The Conservative Party, the British Conservative Party, had actually given the Republican Party some help during the 1992 presidential election, and Clinton was not happy about that. So that served to sort of sour the relationship. And actually, if you pick up any sort of international British international relations journal in the early to mid 1990s, almost invariably there were articles written about the death of the special relationship between Britain and the United States. And you know, one of the arguments was that with the Cold War over, Britain was no longer regarded as being special by the United States. Instead, Germany is viewed as being the coming coming power. Um, potentially America's most important partner in Europe. In fact, Bush um, offers Germany what he describes as partners in leadership, essentially saying to the Germans, you know, we would like, you know, we would like to work with you. Um, a proposition that the new, that the, that the German Chancellor, Chancellor of the newly united Germany, Helmut Kohl, rejects, you know, Kohl is very, very sensitive to how others perceive a united Germany. You know, he, he was reluctant to take on a sort of overt leadership position in European affairs, lest it lead to increased suspicions among Germany's neighbours. But nonetheless, it sort of indicated that the United States in this period was beginning to sort of reevaluate its relations with, with, uh, with, with uh, various European states. There's also an argument, I think this is perhaps more applicable in the mid to late 1990s, maybe after Kohl disappears from the German scene after 1998. But one of the arguments is that a post-Cold War united Germany begins to behave more like a normal great power in the sort of European context. So whereas during the Cold War, essentially, uh, you know, the Germans sort of bankroll the European project and are willing to accept French leadership. By the 1990s, an increasing number of German politicians are saying, hang on a minute, you know, we, we're the biggest single contributor to the European Union. Uh, we expect to, to have the biggest say that you know, we expect to have more influence when it comes to the decision making process. As I say, coal, I think, is you know, is relatively restrained when he during his time in power. Cole, obviously, pretty much of a sort of Second World War generation. I mean, he'd been a child during the Second World War, but he'd sort of experienced it. Cole ultimately retires at the end of 1998. Uh, well, I'm not sure if it's the end of 1998, but anyway, at some point in 1998. Um, and a new, much younger German Chancellor take, takes over, Social Democratic Chancellor Gerhard Schroeder. Um, and he is certainly sort of less, you know, less sensitive to the to 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 others' perceptions of Germany, and more willing to allow Germany, as I say, to behave like a normal power. Then we have the issue of NATO, and as I say, that an alliance without an enemy. Um, 1990 London Declaration, as we mentioned, uh, NATO explicitly says that the Soviet Union is no longer regarded as an enemy. Which then sort of begs the question, well, if there isn't an external enemy any anymore, um, why do we need the alliance? Why do we need to have NATO? And uh, there are certainly many people thinking that with the Cold War over, NATO should actually be dismantled. Chancellor Kohl himself briefly put, proposes the idea that NATO should be replaced with the OSCE, the OSCE basically growing out of the old Conference of Security Cooperation in Europe, elevated to the status of a permanent international organisation, I think in 1990. Um, 
And Cole said, look, we've got a pan-European security organization. Perhaps, you know, perhaps we should simply disband NATO and the OSCE will take over as the, you know, as the organization. From Cole's perspective, it has certain advantages, not least because it is pan-European. Um, so it includes all European states. Um, but ultimately, it's the it's the Americans who sort of vetoed this idea and said, no, 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 we still want NATO. We still want to continue with NATO. The OSCE is not a substitute for NATO. And again, I think there are various reasons for that, which I will leave for our discussion. But ultimately, you know, NATO persists. And I, I think there are several reasons why NATO continues. Um, again I perhaps perhaps I will deal with that in our discussion class rather than you know go through each of the reasons now um but I mean yeah again just to cut a long story short essentially though it's it's the United States as much as anybody I mean not just the United States you know there are plenty of other Europeans not, not least the British who also are firmly of the view that NATO needs to continue into the post-Cold War world but if you're not you know if, if it's no longer about simply containing the Soviet Union then you have to ask yourself you know what why do we need NATO um, and essentially there's a sort of recognition that NATO's mission is going to have to change uh, now that the Cold War has come to an end um what kind of cold what kind of role was that going to be as i said the final point the us also argues that it needs this new role what sort of role was it actually going to be essentially the american position is that the, is that nato needs to go out of area it should no longer be a purely defensive pact a european organization but essentially nato should be used to conduct opposite operations beyond Europe itself, or at least certainly beyond the sort of European NATO area. Uh, Richard Lugia, who I think was um, on, you know, he was an American senator and on the Senate uh, Foreign Relations Committee, he famously says NATO has to go, go out of area or out of business. So in other words, the Americans are sort of pushing for this, for this new for this new role for NATO. There's also much discussion about whether or not um, the organization, whether NATO should actually be enlarged to include new member states and whether um, uh, those states which had once been part of the communist empire in Eastern Europe, whether they should be allowed to become NATO members. Early 1990s, there are several countries which are not enthusiastic about the idea of enlarging NATO. France, I think, is foremost among them. But I think Clinton is also rather ambivalent initially about the idea of NATO enlargement. As an alternative to full membership, uh, the United States offer a new initiative which becomes known as Partnership for Peace. So in other words, establishing uh, cooper cooperation with uh, with neighboring European countries, uh, but which fell far short of full NATO membership, which countries like Poland are relatively disappointed, but they see, you know, they see partnership for peace as a potential, uh, as a potential road, which might ultimately lead to NATO membership. It's not until the mid 1990s, and I think the approach of the pres 1996 presidential election, that Clinton ultimately sort of changes his mind and decides to come down fully in favor of a limited NATO enlargement. And of course, in 99, um, three, new, um, three new members are brought into the alliance from, you know, from the former communist bloc, Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary. As I mentioned earlier, in the 90s, uh, there is a sort of progressive institutionalization of the transatlantic uh, of the transatlantic relationship. Um, and this is sort of reflected in the mid 90s, this is 1995, in again, another more detailed statement, I'll say, that, that, the, that the European Union and the United States issue. Um, and it has four aspects to it. Number one, as we can see here, they argue that the United States and the EU should work together to promote peace and stability, democracy, development, uh, 
Uh, number two, that they should respond to global challenges, which is a rather, sort of, uh, you know, rather broad and ambiguous statement. Three, contribute to the expansion of world trade and closer economic relations. Uh, this certainly happens, obviously, in the 1990s. You see the uh, general agreement to tariffs and trade elevated to the World Trade Organization. Um, and building bridges across the Atlantic. So there is certainly this aspiration to continue this close transatlantic partnership. Um, in terms of the institutions, before I get on to this slide, I mean, first of all, it's important to note the EU itself begins to start developing the apparatus to perform some kind of foreign policy role. So in the 1970s, Henry Kissinger famously asks, who do I call if I want to call Europe? Um, by the 1990s, the Europeans were going, beginning to be able to provide an answer to that question. Um, in the sense that the Maastricht Treaty in 1993, you know, it famously has three pillars. One of these pillars is this idea that there will be a common foreign and security policy. There's an EU commissioner responsible for the EU's foreign relations. So if you like, the EU begins to develop the sorts of institutions that are needed if you are going to conduct foreign policy. Obviously, this kind of continues into the 21st century. Uh, the Lisbon Treaty sort of markedly upgrades the EU's capacity to do this when essentially establishing EU embassies in, you know, in a number of countries around the world. Um, so, yeah, I mean, that, that that is an important moment. There are sort of bilateral meetings, conferences between the US president and the European Commission, which are which are, which are established. So you're beginning to see, as I say, a number of institutions being constructed, which will allow for uh, kind of continued EU American collaboration. On the other hand, there are areas, as ever, in which the Europeans and the United States find themselves at loggerheads. Um, I'll run through these quickly. One, then as now, really, was global warming, with I think the Europeans taking the issue in the 1990s more seriously than, uh, than, than the United States. Actually, in fairness to Clinton, I mean, Clinton and especially Al Gore, who obviously recognised you know, the problem and the scale of the challenge is not so much, um, you know, it's not so much the president um, or the executive branch, which is the problem, but Congress. And again, as I would say, it's then and now, you know, ultimately it's Congress, which is deeply reluctant to sort of make the deep cuts, uh, which would be necessary uh, to bring uh, um, um, uh, global greenhouse um, emissions uh, under under control. Another area, and again, then as now, into the International Criminal Court, um, the American argument is that American soldiers should be given some kind of dispensation simply because the United States committed so many of its soldiers to peacekeeping operations and things like that. Um, the Europeans find it hard to take that argument too seriously. And then as ever, there are several trade disputes in the 1990s. Uh, especially on agriculture, steel as well uh, becomes a, becomes a, becomes a significant issue. Helms Burton Act, which the United States passes, which imposes sanctions against states which are trading with Cuba, uh, which basically is the EU because the Europeans can have, have long traded with Cuba, so they, you know they had not followed the example of the United States. That causes problems. Um, on the other hand, the Uruguay round completed in, I think it's in 1993, which leads to a significant liberalisation of world trade. Yeah, I mean, you can debate whether or not that was necessarily a good thing. Certainly Donald Trump would probably argue, have argued against it. Uh, but not only Trump in fairness, you know, there are plenty of others, even at the time, who, who, who felt this agreement was quite controversial for a number of reasons. Um, but it does lead to the creation of the World Trade Organization. It should be noted that, you know, it's the EU negotiating, negotiating as a block within uh, the GATT and then the World Trade Organization. So again, you know, we're thinking about the influence of the European Union in the international, you know, in the international context. Um, in the area of trade, at least, the EU is definitely a superpower. You know, it 
does speak with one voice and carries a huge amount of weight. As we already noted in passing, 1990s also witnesses an acceleration of European integration. Um, so 1993, uh, the Maastricht Treaty comes into force and establishes the European Union, although, you know, from the beginning there are divisions. When we think about Brexit today, actually, a lot of the leading figures who campaigned for Britain's withdrawal from the European Union, um, they emerge around this time in the early 1990s. You know, the Maastricht Treaty itself becomes a hugely divisive issue in British politics. And, you know, there are, there's an awful lot of scepticism about, about whether... Britain should actually commit itself. Um, ultimately, John Major, the British Prime Minister, does manage to get the treaty passed and ratified, but it comes at immense sort of political cost. And as I say, it leads to some pretty, pretty um, sore divisions within the British body politic, which sort of persists through the 90s and then into into the 2000s and you know I think it's a process which does ultimately you know culminate with the referendum in 2016 and Britain's eventual departure from the European Union. Um, Denmark though I mean we mentioned Britain but you know there were other countries as well which uh, which you know also had problems <laughs> Uh, political problems. Denmark, um, in a referendum, I think, rejected the original treaty. Um, but as I say, the Maastricht Treaty does talk about this idea that there will be a European foreign policy, a common foreign and security policy. And increasingly, the Europeans are talking in terms of creating some kind of European defence identity. In general, European views of uh, sorry, American views of European integration. As I say, the first point there, yeah, the Clinton administration, I think, is broadly positive in terms of their views on European integration. Um, so a more integrated Europe was be seen as in the interests of the United States. Um, there's also a hope, I think, in the Bush administration in the early 1990s that with the Cold War over and the division of Europe coming to an end, that the EU would quickly expand uh, eastwards. I think there's an ex expectation at the beginning of the 1990s that it would be the EU which would be the first to enlarge and then NATO would follow on later. Um, the reason why the Americans are quite keen for this process to take place is a, is a belief that the prospect of EU membership and adventure and eventual admission into the European Union, that this would serve to stabilise Eastern Europe. Um, the problem though, of course, is that to become a member of the European Union, that is not a quick process. And I think it had become by, you know, by the 1990s, it had become an, an especially protracted process. You know, there are vast reams of European laws and regulations which um, uh, candidate member states need to you know need to conform to so there are protracted negotiations over you know, over the uh, um, aqua communitaire um, the agreements or the conditions which the you know the prospective member states would need to satisfy so as i say it becomes clear that eu membership is not going to happen anytime soon and as we've already noted eventually clinton after some hesitation but clinton eventually comes down in favour of, as I say, a limited NATO enlargement in 99. So by the end of the 20th century, um, NATO has already undergone its first enlargement. Obviously, in the 21st century, other Eastern European countries would also become members. You know, there are periodic enlargements uh, during the noughties. Um, US attitudes to European security, as I say, you know, what is NATO for? And Increasingly, the American view is that NATO has to go out of area or out of business. The Americans also press for NATO enlargement. And it's important to note that, generally speaking, if the Americans want something in NATO, they get it, being the, being the dominant power. Um, and it's in the 90s that, that yes, there are... A, a, a number of reforms which are designed to give NATO some kind of out of area role. One of these reforms are what were known as joint, oh, well, 
can't try and remember now. Um, uh, CJTF, something joint task force, it com committee or combined joint task force, something like that. Google it. <laughs> um, but essentially, these are sort of committees which countries could sort of opt in or opt out of. So it was designed to give sort of NATO member states some sort of flexibility. It's around this time that this phrase starts being used, which is coalitions of the willing. Now that doesn't become popularized until around 2002, 2003, when the Americans start talking about a coalition of the willing when it comes to the war on terror. But this idea, this notion that some countries might opt in, others might opt out, that NATO and the European Union uh, would have some kind of flexibility. Um, this is an idea that starts, as, you know, as I say, emerges really in the in the in the in the mid 1990s. Um, this idea that European forces would be separate but not separable, um, and there's in, an increasing debate, and we'll get onto this in the next slide as to what the relationship between some kind of EU defence policy or defence identity and you know how that I suppose would be kind of fit into NATO. Um, as I said, they're conflicting British and French attitudes towards this idea of a European defence identity. Essentially, the British are eager to ensure that if the European Union was to have some kind of defence policy or defence identity, it would have to be subservient to NATO, that NATO should remain the dominant security organisation um, in Europe. In contrast, France adopting, let's say, a fairly sort of traditional Gaullist attitude, you know, their belief was that that, that um, a European defence policy should, you know, should be European, it should not be, you know, it should be uh, able to uh, um, stand on its own two feet, it should not necessarily be completely subordinate to NATO. As a result of this, in the 90s, um, the Western European Union is formed as a compromise between these two views. The Western European Union was a sort of holdover from the Brussels, 1948 Brussels Pact. So it was a sort of European organisation which exists on papers, on paper, uh, but the British sort of resuscitate it in the mid 90s and say, look, we've already got this organisation. If you want a European defence organisation, here you are. From the British perspective, the WEU is viewed as a good thing because it's sort of hardwired into the organisation that it is going to play a subordinate role of NATO. Um, so the British sort of triumph over the French in saying, if we're going to have a European security organisation, as I say, it must be subordinate to NATO. Arguably, though, when you look at how things eventually pan out, the British sort of win this particular battle, but they lose the war because 21st century, um, the WEU is basically sort of disbanded when the, when the EU finally does adopt what becomes known as a European security and defence policy. So you know, eventually does sort of embrace the idea that it should have some kind of independent defence policy. Um, separate from NATO. Um, from the American perspective, this idea of a European defence identity, um, on the one hand, the Americans sort of welcome this because finally, it seems, the Europeans are beginning to take defence seriously, which from the American perspective has to be a good thing. On the other hand, there are, you know, there was concern that a European defence policy might over time start to erode NATO's credibility. Madeleine Albright, Clinton's Secretary of State during his second administration, warns against the three Ds, and she says these are delinking, duplication, and discrimination. Um, and she essentially says that uh, discrimination is. Um, discrimination against those states which were members of NATO but which weren't members of the European Union which basically means the United States, Canada and Norway. Um, Iceland as well I suppose but I don't think anybody was worrying too much about Iceland. Um, duplication, um, you know an obvious concern that that the EU and NATO could be simply sort of repeating themselves and so wasting resources by duplicating the same sort of functions and delinking, or I think sometimes described as decoupling, this idea that, 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 that 
there was a danger that a European defence identity might ultimately lead to um, a decoupling of the United States from Europe. Um, so as I say, the United States does become in, rather concerned that a European security defence policy would actually lead to a weakening of NATO. The important thing, as I said at the beginning to note, is that these debates are very much taking in place in the context of the ongoing war in Yugoslavia. And I think one of the lessons that the Americans and the Europeans take away from this is that Europe is far too reliant on the United States, that ultimately they are too dependent on the United States when it comes to projecting military power. This is revealed in 1995 when NATO goes into action to bring um, the war against the war in Bosnia to an end. Um, it's, it's even more starkly revealed in 1999 when you have the Kosovo war. Um, and one consequence of that is I think that does galvanize the Europeans to take defense more seriously. Um, one significant change is that by 98, uh, where you have the signing of the same Marlow Agreement. Um, you have Tony Blair as Prime Minister of Britain, and Blair, by British standards at least, is pretty pro-European. Um, and he embraces this idea that, that, that Europe should be given a sort of stronger defence identity. Um, and Britain and France being the two major sort of military players um, in Europe, um, Blair and Chirac, Prime Minister of Britain, President of France, you know, they agree at St. Malo that they will, that they will sort of strengthen and cooperate um, uh, when it comes to um, um, European, Europe's defence capabilities. So in general then, early 1990s, what can we say? The United States doesn't actually disengage from Europe. So in that sense, the isolation, you know, the, sorry, the realists were wrong about the United States retreating into isolation. Um, European integration continues in the 90s. So again, the sort of realist scepticism appeared to be unjustified. You know, real, Europe does not disintegrate in the 1990s. Um, the Americans are reasonably supportive of European integration. As I say, US-EU relationship becomes increasingly institutionalized. NATO certainly doesn't disappear. In fact, it actually gets bigger. Given a sort of broader non-Article 5 role, you have things like the St. Petersburg tasks, incidentally, which talk about um, um, European forces being given a sort of paramilitary role, Coast Guard activities, stuff like that. Um, Europeans do begin to develop some parallel security structures, although you have to say you know, it's pretty limited. Even today, you know, this idea of a European security and defence policy is still, you know, it's still pretty limited. You know, the EU is not really a strategic competitor to NATO, at least not in the military. Um, and yeah, the US demands that, they that these sorts of changes complement NATO, or compete with it, I suppose. Um, so yeah, at the end of the 1990s, as I say, seemingly um the realist view the pessimistic view did not actually fully materialize um having said that and we will you know we will uh, talk a little bit about kosovo i mean i'm conscious of the fact that uh, this sort of course ends beginning of the uh, or end of the 20th century beginning of the 21st century so i'm not going to take us into the war on terror and the divisions which emerge over iraq and things like that for this course um, but I think Kosovo, the experience of Kosovo, which, which I'll talk in, about in more detail in the next class, that does, I think, reveal um, some potential problems which were to come. And uh, as I say, we will talk about some of that in a moment.